Okay, good morning. Um, we're going to start uh, pedigrees, which is the last major topic in our Mendelian Genetics Unit in Biology 30. And so I'm going to split this into probably at least two videos. Um, in the first part, we're just going to talk about what a pedigree is and what the terminology looks like in a pedigree and what different symbols mean. And so when we're looking at a pedigree, we need to understand that this is a way of seeing basically a family tree. We are looking at um, an entire family, uh, multiple generations in that family or in that lineage, and we're trying to see how a trait or perhaps more than one trait are passed along in that larger family tree. And so we follow um, each family unit through generations. So a mother and a father, uh, their offspring, so their kids, we might be looking at their genders, so like how many daughters are there, how many sons are there, um, who might marry into that family, what kids they might make, and then the entire time we're tracking what offspring or which individuals in that pedigree are affected by a trait or not affected by a trait. So in other words, do they express the phenotype or do they not express the phenotype? So uh, with a pedigree, we have certain symbols that we want to take advantage of. Uh, the first is this open circle. So if you have an open circle, we're discussing a female. An open square is looking at a male. Uh, anytime you have um, an or uh, a symbol that is shaded in, that shaded in symbol is going to refer to somebody who is affected by a trait. So they express the trait in question. Doesn't have to be, we use the word affected, but we're not necessarily mean that they have a disease and they're affected by that disease. We just mean that they show the trait. So it could be that we're following blonde hair. And so if they're shaded in, they express or are affected by the blonde hair trait. The phenotype is expressed. And so open circles are females, closed, closed squares are males. Anything that's shaded in would be an affected individual. So a, a shaded in circle is an affected female, a shaded in square is an affected male. When you see two lines connecting a male and a female, um, that are directly side by side, this refers to inbreeding. So this would be mating between relatives. And so um, depending on your family tree or the pedigree that you're looking at, if it's in humans, um, you very well might see uh, inbreeding like this. For most of the examples we'll do though, you won't see inbreeding as the example, but just be aware that yeah, it, can happen and so we do express that in a pedigree and sometimes that's important if that has occurred in a family tree or in a lineage we want to track where that inbreeding has occurred because that may show why some traits are expressed more than others in certain scenarios um another symbol i want you guys to just be aware of is when you have uh, a, a female and a male and you've got this um sort of triangle connection between the two that's expressing fraternal twins and then if you have a straight line connecting that triangle that's expressing identical twins so just a little legend to be aware of um, when you see these in a pedigree and i'll show you what a, a larger pedigree will look like in a moment so a line straight down from an individual is always going to indicate that it's an offspring uh, we always put the oldest offspring on the left most side of our pedigree and the younger ones are always written further to the right. Affected individuals are always shaded in. So these four rules here we'll want to kind of keep in mind as we move forward. And so we've got a little example here. Let's start on the left. Um, the circle represents a female. A square represents a male. Shaded shapes represent family members with one expression of a trait. Maybe we're looking at dimples, right? When you smile, you get those little dots. Some people have more pronounced dimples. Some people don't have any dimples showing at all. And so shapes that are not shaded in represent members of the family with no dimples because they're not affected by the trait. So in this particular example, the shaded in woman has dimples. She's affected by the dimple trait. The non-shaded in square is a male that is not affected by that trait. 
the middle here, we've got a horizontal line used to connect, and this is always going to be two parents. So remember, when you have a horizontal single line connecting a male and a female, this is referring to a mating event, okay? Mating to make offspring. So we have to have a biological female and a biological male. Now, if we go to the furthest right here and you look at this picture, we've got a shaded in female. So that means she's affected by whatever trait we're looking at. Let's say it's dimples still. And we've got her mating with a male who is not shaded in. So that male is not affected. So we can safely say that this male that she mates with does not have dimples, but she does have dimples. Now, the line coming down is going to show that they have kids. Now, they have three children. Two of those children are female. One of those children is male. Two of those children, which both happen to be female, are shaded in, which means that they are affected by this trait. They have dimples. This very last son that these two parents have, um, he's not shaded in. So he's an open square, which means that he does not have dimples. He's not affected by this trait. Now, we can also remember that the order that we write these offspring in indicates how old they are. The ones on the furthest left, on the left-hand side, they, have, they were born first. And then the ones that are the youngest are on the right-hand side. They were born uh, most recently. So we've got the oldest daughter, the middle daughter, and then the youngest son. So lines connect parents um, and children. The oldest children are placed on the left and the youngest children are placed on the right. In this example, there are three children, two females and a male, and the male has no dimples. Okay, so let's look at a family tree. This is the Lee family. All right, so we've got a family tree. I've got parents. They had multiple kids, but notice how some of these individuals don't have lines coming directly down from the parents. And if that's the case, if there's no line coming directly down from the parents, I'm looking at this, this male, this female, and this male, they are married in. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, and so here we go. I've got a not affected mother mates with an affected father. This is going to be your first generation. They have kids. This individual, this individual, this individual, and this individual because they have lines directly connecting from parents to kids. That's generation number two. Generation number two. Those individuals in generation number two marry, a, marry off, right? Most of them did. This woman did not. But this man married into the family. This woman married into the family. This man married into the family. And so they have kids as well. That's the third generation down here. So labeling our generation. We use Roman numerals to indicate the generation, typically written on the far left side of the pedigree. And you're going to have generation one, generation two, and generation three, very clearly labeled. Also very helpful to answering questions when we're specifically referring to individuals in a particular generation when you might have multiple generations out in front of you in a pedigree. This one is relatively simple. We can have very large, relatively complicated pedigrees as well. So we always want to make sure we know our basics here. So this is individuals one and two in generation one. I can go ahead and label each member of the second generation and we'll just go left to right. Um, individual one, individual two, individual three, individual four, five, six, and seven. Now I can say some things here. I could say individuals two, five, and seven have married into the family. I can say that individual one and four are, are offspring, a female and a male that are affected. They have dimples. I could say that uh, offspring three and six are both daughters, which were not affected by the dimple trait, so they don't have dimples. And I can do the same for the third generation. And I can make similar statements there. So we can now take advantage of this numbering system and actually identify who we're talking about. So question number two here, how many children did uh, generation one, person one, and generation one, person two have? Well, I gotta look, generation one, person one and two, right here, our, our grandparents, I guess. And so they had how many kids? Well, they had one kid, two kids, three kids, four kids. They had four children. 
not every person down on the second generation is a biological child of person generation one one and generation one two because some of these were married into the family what was their sex well we had uh, two females a male and another female so two daughters a son and a daughter which one was the oldest well the one written on the furthest left is always the oldest so this daughter over here generation two person one uh, was a daughter she happened to have dimples i know that because she shaded in on our pedigree uh here's a good question assuming that having dimples is the recessive trait and no dimples is the dominant trait write the genotypes for all the individuals on the pedigree so this is a classic punnett square question step one write your legend well dimples is going to be recessive and so we'll use a little d for dimples makes sense good letter to use We'll use a capital D if they have no dimples. And so that's the dominant trait. And it's asking us to go and fill in the genotypes of every single individual in this pedigree. It might take a second, but it's good practice because in a bit in the next video, I'll show you how you're gonna have to actually do this multiple times for any question and any pedigree. Um, and so let's start. Individual number one here, is a woman. Her gender doesn't matter in this case because we're not necessarily talking about a sex link trait. In the next video, I'll show you an example or two where we talk about a sex link trait. But right now, don't sweat it. It's not a sex link trait, it's an autosomal trait. So let's go ahead and say that this woman is not affected. So she could be uh, either big D, little d, or big D, big D. I actually don't know for sure which one she is right now. Um, but I do know that she has to have one dominant big D because that's the no dimples trait according to our legend and the question. And she wasn't shaded in. So she does not have dimples. Uh, the, the generation one individual number two, the male, was shaded in. He has dimples. So he can only have one genotype option and that's little d, little d. I'm going to go ahead and do the same for every single individual in generation number two. And you'll notice that anybody who's shaded in must have the homozygous recessive genotype. So little d, little d. Um, generation number three, same thing. If you're shaded in, you, in this case, have to be homozygous recessive. So the only individual uh, that didn't have dimples in generation three was person generation three, person four, this daughter right here. Um, she didn't have dimples, so she had for sure one big d. Now. You might be asking yourself, well, how do I know if these the, the folks here that aren't shaded in, are they big D, big D, or are they big D, little d? There is a way of finding out, um, and we will discuss that very specifically in the next video on pedigrees when we actually figure out the mode of inheritance and we identify who has what genotype precisely. And it's a bit of trial and error, and I'll go through that method with you. Uh, okay, wonderful Punnett square question. What is the chance that the next child of individual 2, 1, and 2, 2, so this family right here, will have dimples? So they had two kids, two sons in this case, uh, and they both happen to have dimples. What are the chances that the next child, the third child, would have dimples? So we have to do a Punnett square. We've got to do a cross. So we're going to cross dad with mom here. So big D, um, little d with little d, little d. And when I go ahead and fill out that Punnett square, I'm going to see that two of these individuals, I don't know their gender, but I know two of these individuals have no dimples because they got the dominant D. And then two of these individuals have homozygous recessive. So they are going to phenotypically show dimples. And so the, there's a 50% chance that they'll have dimples because two out of the four possible offspring have dimples here. We can add a little bit more complication to this and we can ask, well, what's the chance that the next child of individuals two, four, generation two, person four and generation two, person five. So now we're looking at this family. What are the chances that their next kid will have dimples and be a boy? So now we're looking at two different probabilities together. We have to use the product rule. And so first step, though, of course, is do your Punnett square. Uh, both mom and dad here have dimples, so their genotypes are little d, little d, and little d, little d. We're going to fill in that Punnett square. Uh, every one of their offsprings has a 100% ch chance of, being, uh, of having dimples, 
but that's not what this question is asking. It's asking what are the chances of being a boy and having dimples? So we're going to take the probability of having dimples um, and multiply it by the probability of having uh, being a boy. And so there's a 100% chance of having dimples, but there's only a 50% chance of being a boy. The product rule says when you're trying to figure out uh, the probability of two or more events occurring together, then you have to multiply their probabilities together. So we have a 100% chance of being uh, of having dimples, a 50% chance of being a boy, because you can either be a boy or a girl. Um, you multiply the two together and you're going to get 0 0.5. You get a 50% chance of being a boy and having dimples if you're the next child of generation two person four and generation two person five. So I'm gonna end this video after this slide here. I just wanna understand, show you guys what modes of inheritance look like. And so modes of inheritance are uh, the various ways that an individual can uh, receive a trait. So how is a trait inherited? How is it passed on? So I'm gonna briefly show this to you here and then I'll explain it in more detail in the next video. So for Y-linked traits, only males are going to be affected because it's only on the Y chromosome. For autosomal traits, so either it's autosomal recessive or it's an autosomal dominant trait, these traits are inherited on the autosomes. So in humans, chromosomes 1 through 22. And then X-linked traits can either be recessive or X-linked dominant, and they are going to be inherited on the X chromosome only, which is one of those 23rd pairs of, of chromosomes in humans. And so I'm just going to briefly show this here, what those look like. The affected genotype for Y-linked looks like this. Autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant look like these. X-linked recessive can be either this or this for a male or a female. And X-linked dominant can look like this for either males or females. Uh, I'm going to leave this video here, and then in the next video, we'll go through the modes of inheritance in significantly more detail, and we'll do a lot more uh, questions applying these to pedigrees. So thanks very much.